Hello, this is Father Simeon, and welcome to the October 14th edition of our Week in Review for next week. So the first thing we're going to talk about is the Sunday of the Seventh Ecumenical Council coming up this Sunday. Now, the Seventh Ecumenical Council was the last of the seven councils. It met in uh, AD 787, and it's also called the Second Council of Nicaea. But the point of the council was to address the heresy of iconoclasm. The iconoclasts were the icon smashers, those who were against the use of images in the churches. So the church gathered together and stated very clearly that the sacred images that are in the church are part of the spiritual life of the church. They are part of the apostolic faith. And the church clearly distinguished between worship, which we direct to God alone, and veneration or honor or respect that we pay to those things that are part of the spiritual life that pertain to God. We kiss the icons. We kiss the gospel book. We kiss the cross. And the church explained how and why we do this, drawing a very clear line, again, between that worship that is due to God alone and the respect, the honor, the veneration that we pay to those things that are dedicated to God. And iconography, the sacred imagery, it affirms that the, the physical, the material world aspect of reality, and the immaterial, the, the spiritual, the invisible aspect of reality, they go together. We have a problem today, in fact. Some people think about life in the body and what they do with their body as being somehow separate from their spirituality. The church has never held this. Right? We make prostrations with the body. We worship God with our bodies. We fast. The body is part of the spiritual life. God created the invisible and the visible creation as good. And God works through physical things, the anointing of oil, for example. God's grace comes through a, a physical thing. And ultimately, this points to the incarnation, right? The one who is immaterial, the one who has given life and existence to all things. The only one who exists by himself, gives existence to all things, became a creature. The uncreated creator, without any change to his divine nature, became a human being, became one of us. This is the, the spiritual and the physical united, divinity and humanity uh, united, the uncreated and the created united in the incarnation. And this is connected to our iconography. In the Old Testament, we were forbidden from making an image of God because God had no image, and yet God took an image in the womb of the virgin an image that people could see, his, his human image. In fact, the scripture says that Christ is the image of the invisible God. Right? That's the icon, the icon of the invisible God. If you want to see the Father, look at the Son. If you see the Son, you see the Father. Christ is actually the, an icon of the Father. So iconography is important in the spiritual life. In fact, the Seventh Ecumenical Council, there is enough here that I may uh, produce a, another recording just on the Seventh Ecumenical Council and also on the nature of the Ecumenical Council. These are rooted in the First Council in the Acts of the Apostles and in, in the Bible. So talking about what an Ecumenical Council is, what did an Ecumenical Council do, uh, and specifically the Seventh Ecumenical Council, that, that is worth its own uh, recording. I don't want to keep this video uh, too 
long. I want to keep it short. So I do want to mention that our iconography may be related in style to ancient Egyptian funeral portraits or mummy portraits. So if you're interested in the iconographic style, there are many different styles that have developed uh, depending on really different cultures and 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 times, although there's a continuity. Iconography must correctly express the apostolic unchanging theology of the church. So if we think about the scripture, it's it's a an icon of who Christ is, the gospels. Uh, they are icons of who Christ is that are written in words, and an icon is an image that expresses who Christ is. So uh, if, if you're interested in the iconographic style, you may look up funeral Egyptian, uh, Egyptian funeral portraits, if you happen to be interested uh, in that, just as an historical aside, I want to read something. This is from a book called Praying with Icons by Jim Forrest. And it, it's a brief story about uh, a Protestant friend uh, named Hans, who had been a teacher in a university and an experience that he had uh, with icons. I want to read this. As a young man, his interest in the novels of Dostoevsky led him to learn Russian, a language which he put to good use later in life. During the Cold War, when he would occasionally travel to Russia on behalf of the International Fellowship of Reconciliation. One day, he was in an Orthodox church in Moscow, standing in front of an icon of Mary and Christ, when an old Russian woman approached him. She could see at a glance that Hans was a foreigner. Few Russians could afford such clothing, and she could see he wasn't Orthodox. He hadn't crossed himself. He hadn't kissed the icon. He was looking at it as one might look at a painting in a museum. Where do you come from? She asked. Holland, Hans replied. Oh, yes, Holland. And are there believers, as Russians refer to Christians, in Holland? Yes, most people in Holland belong to a church. He could see the doubt in her face. She began to cross-examine him. Are you also... And you also are a believer? Yes, in fact, I teach theology at the university. And people in Holland, they go to church on Sunday? Yes, most people go to church. We have churches in every town and village. And they believe in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? She crossed herself as she said the words. Oh, yes, Hans assured her. But the doubt in her face increased. Why had he not crossed himself? Then she looked at the icon and asked, And do you love the mother of God? Now Hans was at a loss and stood for a moment in silence. Good Calvinist that he was, he could hardly say yes. Then he said, I have great respect for her. Such a pity, she replied in a pained voice, but I will pray for you. Immediately she crossed herself, kissed the icon, and stood before it in prayer. Do you know, Hans told me, from that day, I have loved the mother of God. Sometimes people wonder about iconography. How do we understand iconography? And much is written on iconography. In fact, you can read defenses of the icons from centuries back. But the way to learn how to pray with an icon is to stand before an icon and pray. It is like many things in the spiritual life. It is learned by, by doing. It is entering into the spiritual experience. Instead of trying to objectively read a bunch of things about it or reading about other people's experiences, it's when we have spiritual experiences ourselves, that's how we learn. How do you learn how to pray? You pray. How do you learn when you see an icon, not to see this picture, but to 
sense the presence of the person that it represents. When Orthodox believers look at an icon of Christ, we can appreciate the, the fineness of the quality of the painting. But when we look at an icon of Christ to pray, we are looking at the one it represents with our hearts. Or we're praying to the prototype. We're, we're praying to Christ himself. When we kiss an icon of Christ, uh, we're not kissing paint and wood. We're not that that's not where our love is going anyway. We're kissing the painted wood, but it's just paint and wood. We are giving love, showing an act of devotion and of worship to Christ himself. We kiss an icon of a saint. We are showing love and respect to a spiritual ancestor, one who showed forth the love of Christ because of Christ's presence within them. We're giving uh, that honor and respect to the uh, person that it represents. When someone kisses my hand as a priest, it's not because they like me individually, but it's a way of reverencing the apostles and the apostolic authority that has been passed down. So there's a little story about, about icons. I could say a lot about icons. So this week, let me talk about some of the saints. We commemorate Saint uh, Longinos, this centurion that we read about in scripture, who was there at the crucifixion of Christ. How much did the crucifixion impress this uh, centurion, who we don't have a, a lot of information about in scripture, but we commemorate him as one of the saints of the church. And um, again, many, many things in the history of the church that have been preserved in the tradition of the church are not in scripture. The gospels, for example, we don't even have a lot of information about uh, the Virgin Mary that we preserve in the church because the point of the gospels, the point is Jesus Christ himself. But it's beautiful to have more information about some of the people we see in Scripture that has been preserved in the history of the church. We commemorate also St. Gaul or Galen, the Enlightener of Switzerland, who was born in Ireland uh, and became a monk, went to a monastery school and then uh, became a monk. And with St. Uh, Columanus, traveled as part of this missionary effort to mainland Europe and is known for his desire for solitude and prayer as well as for his preaching. That's a great combination to have, the inner silence, and to be able to express the love of God to draw people into that peace. And he reposed in uh, on October 16th in 645. Some of these dates may be approximate. Sometimes we have different uh, dates according to sources. Cosmos and Damien of Arabia we commemorate. There are three sets of Cosmos and Damien saints that are commemorated on different days. And these were two brothers. All of, all of the Cosmos and Damien saints, by the way, uh, the, the pairs of saints, were unmercenary physicians. And what that means is that they were physicians that healed beyond the medical science of the day through the grace of God. Unmercenary, uh, think of a mercenary as one who takes money to do something, and unmercenary as one who does not take money. They were, they were healing with more than medicine, with the grace of God, uh, freely they have received, freely they give, right? So they didn't take payment because they, it, was, it was the work of God through them that ultimately healed. And God heals through medicine. God heals outside of medicine. All of that is healing that that comes from God. And they they refused to renounce Christ and they were they were beaten and thrown into the sea, but an angel rescued them. And as we see in the the stories of other saints, they were rescued to show the power of God and then they were martyred uh, successfully. And uh, they were beheaded with uh, three fellow Christians. One of the uh as I said these are one of the three sets of unmercenaries and the other two are uh, Saints Cosmos and Damien of Asia Minor, or perhaps Mesopotamia, according to some sources, with their mother, Saint Theodota, and Saint Cosmos and Damien of Rome. So there are several 
as I said, uh, sets of Cosmos and Damien unmercenary physicians, the Holy Apostle and Evangelist Luke. So St. Luke is uh, a physician from Antioch in Syria. So very important to those of us who are Antiochian. I already mentioned that three other physicians from the first century are, are women. I mentioned in, in, in uh, a past episode, but here is St. Luke. He's counted among the 70 apostles. Remember, there were 12 apostles, but there were also the, the 70 and a companion of St. Paul. He wrote the gospel of Jesus Christ, according to St. Luke, and uh, sort of the sequel to his gospel, the Acts of the Apostles. It's interesting when you read through the Acts of the Apostles and uh, you start seeing the word we which is when Luke is included right in the story. He's regarded also as the first iconographer, having painted an icon of the Virgin Mary, and he is represented as a calf, the four evangelists, the gospel writers. Remember, evangelist in the Orthodox Church, we use that to refer to a gospel writer. The evangelists have uh, symbols that are animals that are... Uh, that represent them that are attached to them and and it is the calf for saint luke for highlighting christ's work as priest and and sacrifice and here are some uh, icons or uh, we, should, we could say perhaps iconographic styles or prototypes that are attributed to saint luke the physician again regarded as the first iconographer We also commemorate St. John of Kronstadt, the wonder worker of Kronstadt. He was an archpriest in the Russian Orthodox Church and, and known especially for his care of the poor. And if you are looking for a spiritual work to read, I recommend St. Siloam the Athenite, St. Sophroni of Essex, St. Porphyrios, the book Wounded by Love, but also among those spiritual texts i would recommend my life in christ the spiritual reflections of saint john of kronstadt who reposed in 1829 we also commemorate the great martyr artemius of antioch a military general and ruler and he served under saint constantine the great and constantius but then we have julian the apostate the emperor who tried to drag the empire back into paganism and saint artemius is known to have stood up to julian the apostate for his apostasy and he was martyred hilarion the great this great ascetic saint born to pagan parents in palestine near gaza in 291 and while studying in alexandria in egypt that great city of learning he uh, became a christian and he went to see saint anthony the great this uh, great ascetic. He's the great. He was uh, one of the great ascetics who lived in the desert. Uh, remember, the great ascetics, uh, some of them went into the desert to live a life of solitude and prayer and, and, and repentance, and, and they fought spiritual battles, but uh, they populated the desert because they went out and uh, they became miracle workers. The grace worked through them so powerfully that it couldn't be kept silent. So uh, they tried to to leave and go out and be on their own, and people just followed them out into the desert and wanted to build huts next to them and go see them uh, because they, they wanted the wisdom through the Holy Spirit uh, and wanted the touch of grace that came through them because of, their, because of their prayer and their repentance. God honors that prayer and repentance. And he had endured the assaults and temptations from the demons. Uh, this is part of the ascetic life, right? Being a monk uh, is, is not an idealistic life where uh, one might think, well, if I get married and have kids, there are all these distractions. So I am going to go live the life of the angels and, and become a monk and it's going to be great. And if you live in a community, you might be living in a, a dorm with a bunch of other people uh, who have come from very different backgrounds and have very uh, different ideas. And there's struggle there. There's struggle there in that community. And if you live by yourself, there also is struggle. There's temptations of, of delusion that you're greater than you think you are and all 
kinds of temptations uh, in this in this spiritual battle. The the more you pray and the more grace you acquire, the more the demons take notice, right? And and through that struggle though comes grace, and he received the grace to cast out demons and to heal. He reposed in three seventy one or three seventy two. And I want to read as we close something that is written by Saint Jerome uh, in Bethlehem in 390 about Saint Hilarion. It's a saint uh, writing about a saint. Again, Saint Jerome was in Bethlehem and, and Saint uh, Hilarion was uh, near uh, Gaza. One night he began to hear the wailing of infants the bleeding of flocks, the lowing of oxen, the lament of what seemed to be women, the roaring of lions, the noise of an army, and moreover, various portentous cries which made him in alarm shrink from the sound ere he had the sight. He understood that the demons were disporting themselves and falling on his knees. He made the sign of the cross on his forehead. Thus armed as he lay, he fought the more bravely half longing to see those whom he shuddered to hear and anxiously looking in every direction. Meanwhile, all at once in the bright moonlight, he saw a chariot and dashing steeds rushing upon him. He called upon Jesus and suddenly before his eyes, the earth was opened and the whole array was swallowed up. Then he said, the horse and his rider has he thrown into the sea and some trust in chariots and some in horses but we will triumph in the name of the Lord our God. So many were his temptations and so various the snares of demons night and day that if I wished to relate them, a volume would not suffice. How often when he lay down did naked women appear to him? How often sumptuous feasts when he was hungry? Sometimes as he prayed, a howling wolf sprang past or a snarling fox and when he sang a gladiatorial show was before him. And a man newly slain would seem to fall at his feet and ask him for burial. Once upon a time, he was praying with his head upon the ground. As is the way with men, his attention was withdrawn from his devotions, and he was thinking of something else. When a tormentor sprang upon his back and driving his heels into his sides and beating him across the neck, with a horsewhip cried out, come, why are you asleep? Then with a loud laugh asked if he was tired and would like to have some barley. So these type of stories, these accounts are not unusual in the life of prayer. The demons want to distract us from prayer. And for some of us, it might be something as simple as we think of something we would we needed to do earlier in the day that we didn't do or something we should do now or we forgot to turn on the washer or something and and that's enough to distract us from prayer the demons want to distract us from prayer so we need when we're praying we need as much as we can to pray and if we're distracted to bring our attention back the stronger our focus then the 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 greater the demons uh, try to distract us. So th this is someone who had great focus and, and notice what happened, uh, how, how great the distraction. For many of us, the demons don't need to do so much. I mean, in church, sometimes kids making noise distract some people, right? But as one has said, when they learn how to pray, the children won't bother them anymore. Uh, once we learn how to have that real focus and the Holy Spirit works in our hearts, uh, to help us. So we need to remember that, that the demons want to distract us and we need to bring our focus back. Also, we need to remember humility, right? If we have experiences, we shouldn't think, oh, look how spiritual I am. I am so spiritual that the demons are after me. That must mean I'm really close to God. We must always have humility. And this is the importance of, of spiritual guidance in the church and, and why in the church a regular confession uh, because it's very easy for us uh, to think we're becoming spiritual when what is happening is the demons are really feeding our narcissism by thinking that we're greater than we really are. We, we need to have a, a real sober view of 
ourselves because uh, the demons can drive us to despair. They can try to tell us we're worthless. And that's not true as we're repenting and recognizing our sins, right? Uh, but it's also the demons, they, they can feed that pride by telling us that we, we're far more advanced than we really are. We need, we need that sobriety. And in the church, we are in it together. That's why we have the priests uh, within the church and we have each other to keep us, to keep us grounded in the spiritual life. Uh, also, uh, we need to realize that when we are tempted, when we have these tempting thoughts from the demons, we, we should see tempting thoughts, whether it's lust or, or gluttony or, or laziness or jealousy as objective from ourselves. We live in a culture that would like us to believe that we are our thoughts, that, that our identity is tied to our thoughts. What does that mean if you have terrible thoughts, if you have really bad thoughts, uh, that, that our inclinations, that our temptations are who we are? And that's not true. We see in this story, these terrible temptations that he's having, where's it coming from? It's coming from the demon. Maybe it comes from the memory. Sometimes uh, we train in the past ourselves to think in a negative way, and those negative ways come, come back. But that doesn't mean that's who we are now. We have to reject those things, right? If we forgive somebody, we may be tempted with unforgiveness. And it doesn't mean that we should despair that we're not being forgiving. We have to reject those thoughts of unforgiveness if we have forgiven and remind ourselves. We have to remind ourselves our, about our dedication to Christ. We reject this thought. We don't want this thought. And we think of something else. If the thought comes back, we keep swatting away like a fly until it goes away, right? And, and uh, if the demons keep bringing them back, uh, maybe it's because it's working, right? We are falling into despair. We are believing that, uh, that our thoughts, our, our sinful temptations, that that's really who we are and we're really a bad person, right? Or are those temptations, well, maybe that's just natural. Maybe I am what my inclinations are, right? Um, we see in this story that that is not true and it's true generally in the spiritual life. We need the discernment uh, and, and the discernment within the church from the apostolic tradition to help us discern uh, those, those thoughts that come to us, right? Even paying attention to the thoughts, by the way, we, we, are, we are giving the thought attention uh, if we psychoanalyze our, ourselves and think, well, why am I having these thoughts? All we're doing is pay attention to the thought. If it is a sinful thought, if we, a, a sinful thought is one that leads us toward a deeper experience of death and away from a deeper experience of life a deeper experience of evil instead of goodness uh, leads us away from becoming who we should be, right? Who's the, who's, who is the one who teaches us what a true human being is Christ himself. It leads us away from that, the self delusion that if we go our own way, that we'll somehow become who we need to be and reach our potential. Uh, we, we need that discernment. So we have to realize that these temptations, these thoughts that we have, if we know that they are sinful and the church teaches us, what is sinful because sin is that self-inflicted wound on the soul and wound in, that we actually perpetuate. Uh, that we hurt other people through our sin too. And we need to know when a thought uh, is that which brings life and really leads us toward God and toward our potential. And, and we need to know when those thoughts really, if we are leading us on a path of, of self-mutilation spiritually, right? Of self-harm spiritually, and leading us toward deeper delusion. And that, and when that's joined with our narcissism and our pride, and we're absolutely sure of our own rightness, despite what God tells us through the church and through the gospel, then uh, that, that's a dangerous combination, pride and delusion. But we see St. Hilarion experienced these things, and, what, and, and he turned his heart in prayer to God. He rejected these uh, very powerful temptations and became a man who could work miracles, the grace of God. So there's this, this, we need to think of it as like training and therapy. It's there as a test in order for us to overcome. And then we can do the opposite, right? Instead of, instead of these, these uh, ideas and temptations leading us toward, toward evil, we become this vessel for the powerful grace 
of God, the purity, the love, the peace, the, the, the power, the presence of God. And we not only experience transformation, uh, transfiguration in our own lives, but we are able to positively affect other people with a power beyond our own human power, with the grace of God. So this man who experienced the demons became one who could cast out the demons and one who was tempted with going on that path of, of death and sickness and harm was able to heal others and experience the healing by the grace in his own life. Let this encourage us all uh, in our spiritual battles. Turn to God. He has the power when we feel that we are weak to overcome. And through it, we can become stronger. The power of the cross is, is to take that which is bad and even, even death and transfer it into something that is for life and health and beauty and peace and love and all of those good things that come through the Holy Spirit. God bless you. Have a good week next week. And uh, God willing, we'll see you in the next video.